Oh, crap. I just realized my webcam might not be working. Hey, this is Zane Simon with uh, episode another episode of the UFC Cutting Room Floor, and all I'm seeing is black, so... Ah, uh, crap. That's not a good thing. I'm... Hey, there we are. And now my camera's working, and I'm back. I should have sorted that out first. Anyway, this is Zane Simon with another episode of the UFC Cutting Room Floor for the month of, covering the month of August, it's September 2nd, so as we all know what that means, that the UFC just let a bunch of guys go, or at least we think they did, because they don't announce that thing, that kind of thing, fighters don't like to talk about that kind of thing, but every once, every month, right around the first, the UFC goes through and updates their online roster of active fighters and deletes a bunch of people, and we can, we more or less take that as they've been cut most of them end up almost all the names on that end up on that list end up going out and fighting for other organizations telling people publicly afterward that they've been cut verifying it so for the sake of our purposes it's a pretty safe assumption that if you see a guy who's uh who who ends up getting removed from the ufc roster on the first of the month they are probably no longer in the ufc and uh, just throw a disclaimer out there to start the show. This isn't supposed to be me kind of reveling and people get getting cut. I'm not happy to see anybody losing their jobs. There's nobody I'm like cheering for and saying, oh, thank God they cut that guy. But just in the interest of kind of keeping up with MMA is sport. It's always nice to know who's fighting where and when and why. And one of the best ways to do that is to also kind of talk about who's no longer fighting who's no longer fighting in the UFC, who's not around anymore, who you can expect not to be seeing. And to that extent too, talking about whether or not we can expect to see them back again, whether these are people get, you know, if you didn't know them before they got released, get to know them a little on their way out the door to know whether or not they're somebody you should be watching for down the line to come back, make a return, look better the second time around or whatever. This month was a very big roster trimming month for the UFC. Last month, they, I think they released about two people, maybe a third retired. I think Mike Swick retired last month, and that was about it. It was a really low, uh, low ebb in terms of UFC ro- trimming back their roster and getting rid of guys. This month was the exact opposite between retirements fighters leaving their contract or leaving the promotion voluntarily and this big slew of cuts they just got rid of one two. 17 fighters this month so or over the last month so that's that's a lot especially when they only brought in i think about 11 or 10 17 is a serious cutback the whole roster itself as a running unofficial total is sitting right around 537 fighters that's um you know last month it was about 548 547 so that should tell you more or less where we are in terms of incoming and outflow or income of talent and outflow not a lot of big names in terms of the actual people that got released today uh probably the most notable fighter and one who announced his retirement recently or his, not retirement, but announced his cut recently was Nicholas Backstrom who announced that he'd been released on John Gooden's podcast. His name came off the books today and he's, he's a young guy. He's only 26. He's only had 10 pro fights. It's not too far into his pro career. Really. He only started training in er- or he only started fighting in earnest regularly back in like 2011. So uh, he's certainly somebody I expect will come or will go back on the regional circuit, get a few fights, come back and do well. Other than that, the, there weren't really any surprises at all. Um, probably the only fighter with, uh, you know, the fighters with winning records were Ildemar Alcantara and Royston Wee and Dan Miller in the UFC winning records, that is. And all of them had looked really, really bad in their last fights. Alcantara looked 
absolutely miserable against Kevin Casey. And just lately, he's been looking less and less capable as time goes on. Royston Weave faced Ningguang Yu, who really exposed... I mean, not that anybody had any, you know, any il- disillusion about who Royston Wee was as a fighter, but uh, Guang Yu really showed that if Royston Wee can't out-wrestle somebody in the UFC or really just be more physically uh, imposing than somebody in the UFC, he's going to get beat up pretty badly by almost anyone out there. So not surprised that either of them got cut and... The other one was with the winning record, Dan Miller, who came back after a long period of inactivity, dealing with his own health issues, dealing with family health issues. And unfortunately, it just kind of looks like the sports passed him by. I don't know if he's planning on retiring. I kind of hope he is for his own sake. But um, everybody else, you know, it was... Just to run down the names really quick, Igor Araujo, Yos Dennis Cedeno, Anthony Christodoulou, uh, Andrew Craig, Cody Gibson, Daryl Montague, Han Stringer, Tom Watson uh, were the other p- fighters released. A lot of middleweights, Miller with Miller, Watson, uh, Alcantara, and they still had Craig listed as a middleweight, but He's down at welterweight at the po- this point. But, uh, yeah, Montague is probably the other fighter of note on that list that's kind of sad. He went 0-3 in the UFC, and really his UFC run was just kind of a big disappointment for everyone that saw him regionally in Tachi Palace and expected him to be a surefire top five flyweight competitor. Um, and honestly, too, his performances. You know, he started out with some kind of, I, I don't want to say forgivable losses, but more understandable losses to John Dodson and Kyoji Horiguchi. But his most recent knockout in the first round, a loss to Willie Gates. Not saying Willie Gates is a bad fighter. He's not. He's big. He's imposing. He's uh, fast. He hits hard. But, you know, for if, if you were supposed to be a top five guy, it's one thing to lose to somebody like Dodson or some somebody like Horiguchi, but you shouldn't be losing a fight to Gates, especially just not getting blitzed out of the blitzed out of the building that early. So Montague's really been a tough loss. And at thirteen and five, you know, his overall record's now thirteen and five. He's twenty seven. He's seven years into his career, and it's tough too because I mean we're, we should really be seeing Montague in his prime. These should be the best years of Montague's career when he's getting the most out of them. And it really seems like he's not, you know, he came into the UFC as a primed top five competitor and it's not happening. And unfortunately, a lot of that too has ended up being because of, Ian, you know, sort of like um, almost the Ian McCall effect where this idea that Ian McCall was a top five flyweight and we're slowly, you know, he he doesn't have the wins at this point to back it up, especially because a lot of that was built off his success over Montague in Tachi Palace. And now we're seeing Montague already gone. And that's kind of, you know, sometimes when you get an insular talent pool that's all, that's all fighting each other, you, it's hard to judge. You know, you see the guy who comes out on top, you're like, oh, well, he's going to be a top five guy. And then when he's not, suddenly everybody else looks a little worse by comparison. So Montague has kind of been a big disappointment. Cody Gibson, Bantamweight guy cut. He's also, uh, unfortunately, you know, 27, 12, and 6, also seven years in. Another guy who really should be in the prime of his career and has ended up looking worse and worse. Um, it seems like, you know, somebody who came in with a lot of aggression and a well-rounded style. And, you know, he, he got a good win over Johnny Bedford. But other than that, everybody's been able to kind of handle his aggression and find the holes in his game because he's so wild. He's willing to just let the fight go anywhere. Got outworked by Douglas De Silva. 
got submitted by Manny Gamburian, got outworked by Aljamain Sterling, just fighters who are, have a more simplified technical go-to game have been able to handle him. And at this point in his career, he could easily come back. You know, he's the kind of guy I would expect to do well at the regional level, but I'm not sure how much growth he's actually going to have on it if he makes it back to the UFC. Um, honestly, other than Royston Wee, surprisingly, the probably the least experienced fighters to get cut, the guys who have the most potential to really improve and turn things around are probably Anthony Craig and Anthony Chris or Andrew Craig and Anthony Christodoulou. Christodoulou is probably not uh, high on that potential because athletically he's just not on the, at the UFC level, doesn't seem to have the physical tools, the strength, the speed um, really made his, his bones on the regional circuit being tougher than everyone. And at the UFC level, pretty much everybody's super tough. So it's hard to, it's hard to be a top competitor at the UFC in the UFC. If, Toughness is really the only thing you got going for you, but Craig's not somebody that I could. Craig's somebody I could see coming back. He's only, you know, his, his record's now nine and four. He's twenty nine, but he's only been fighting for about five years. So, with a couple more years under his belt, um, chance to improve at the regional level, maybe snag a regional title. I could see the UFC bringing him back for a late a late run. Um. A few guys who are on their way out who just probably are not going to come back one way or another. Alcantara and Araujo are both now in their 30s. They've both been fighting for 10 years. They both have around 30 fights in their pro career. They're guys that have really have a long career under their belt. Same with Stringer. He's only 28, a few years younger, but he's 22 and 7. Uh, he's had over 30 pro fights couple draws i think or no contests in there um has been fighting for 10 years been fighting a pro since he's 18 and that just wears on you i mean the chance of the of those guys going out and finding success over high level regional competition and making a good run back to the ufc are just not strong unless they get you know unless it's a case of them winning one or two fights and then getting, you know, Stringer getting picked up for a European regional show or Raja getting picked up for a uh, showdown in Brazil when they need somebody at the last minute. But otherwise, those guys are probably not going to be back. Dan Miller, as I talked about, um, has only had 22 pro fights, but he's in now in his mid-30s. He's been around for a decade be surprised. I, I mean, like I say, I kind of hope he retires. Tom Watson too. It's now in his mid thirties, coming up on nine years. Guy that I, you know, th these are guys who've had a full career at this point, getting released. So I'd be surprised how much they've, uh, if they had a lot left in the tank for a secondary run. Um, in retirement no no uh, retirement news. Fighters we can't expect back necessarily at all no matter uh, and obviously big nog just retired um he had been you know the ufc had said they weren't going to give him any fights he was saying oh i'm not sure i like, might like to fight again but i'll take this job with the ufc for now he's now just as of yesterday officially retired and hung up his gloves that's good news um we had a couple of really young fighters retire last month too. Jordan Meehan, Frankie Perez. Meehan's another guy kind, kind of in that Stringer position. Better fighter than Stringer, but, you know, retiring in his mid-20s with just about 40 pro fights and a nine-year career. So I would not be at all surprised to see Meehan just stay gone and out of the game permanently. Frankie Perez... You know, sounded a little more conflicted about it, but hopefully he can stay out. Just not because I have anything about against Frankie Perez. It's just a tough way to make a living, um, especially as a lightweight. Your chances of climbing the UFC ladder to great success and fame and money are really limited. So Perez getting out at just 25 or 26 with only with like 10 pro fights and his first UFC win under his belt. Good on him. I was really glad to hear him say that. I think that's a smart move. I think he, if you you know feel like you can do other things in your life, that's always a good way to go. 
Otherwise, we saw Josh Thompson uh, fight out his contract and go to Bellator. That's That was it's a little surprising. I mean, you know, the Punk's been a mainstay in Strike Force, legit top 10, top 15 talent in the UFC the whole time he's been there. May not have won all the big fights that people expected him to win, but he was highly competitive at the top of the division. And also in, a, in an odd position where, you know, with only nine fights under Zufa, even including his strike force career, he really was not making a lot of sponsorship money. And so I'm not surprised that he maybe felt like he could go out and test the market and get more out of Bellator. If, you know, you, even if he gets like a, a 20 and 20 contract and can only make 20 grand in sponsorship or something like that, that may be, provide him more guaranteed money at forty thousand dollars than he feels like he could get out of the UFC. I don't know. I'm I'm just doing that math off the top of my head, so don't take any any of it seriously. But it's an interesting thing to see more guys potentially more guys, especially longtime veteran fighters who are no no longer near a title shot in the UFC, to see if those guys start looking more closely at whether or not they want to test out Bellator and see if they can get a better offer out of them and Especially, you know, if they feel like they can get more sponsorship money to make up for, to, to give them a guarantee, a higher guaranteed purse per fight, that might be an interesting trend we're going to start seeing here with the Reebok deal, really limiting sponsorship opportunities in the UFC. Otherwise, fighter signing news. The UFC signed, a, you know, they signed about 11 guys, I think, 10 guys, one, two, three. Nine, nine-ish, nine-ish fighters, ten fighters over the last month. I talked a little bit on my last show about Abdul Kareem Edelov. So I'm not going to go over that again, except to say that he's a really exciting light heavyweight that I'm really pumped for. Um, they did pick up a couple heavyweights just the other day. They announced the signing of Luis Henrique. He's going to be taking on a new French heavyweight who looks like an absolute. Um, not talent wise phenom, you know, not like a guy who's got some huge sambo or karate or wrestling background, but just a physical freak and Francis Naganu, uh, out of France, huge fighter. It's like six, four, two fifty, just a beast. He, he's kind of, I think he, he's kind of the answer for everybody who's always said, Oh, well, what if X, you know, like what if this physical or what if this NFL defensive end at decided to go into the UFC with a couple of years of sprawl training and boxing, that would be Francis Naganu. He's the answer to that question of what can an amazing NFL caliber athlete do with a minimal amount of fight training. And uh, he's going to be taking on Luis Henrique, who he should beat, but it's heavyweight, so it's always kind of a mystery. Hardest head tends to win. UFC also signed really promising welterweight Sage Northcutt. He's got a long point karate background, which he seems to have translated really well into a style that kind of reminds me a little bit of Leota Machida. Very kick heavy on the outside, likes to draw guys into him when they rush in, tends to counter with hard punches off his rear hand. And, uh, Throw, you know, will like rush in with a big flurry off a counter. Has a really punishing ground and pound game. Just looks looks like a great fighter. Looks like a really promising young welterweight. He's only 19, 5 and 0. Oh. Picked up a couple of Japanese fighters, Yusuke Kasuya and Kaita Nakamura. Nakamura is getting his second UFC run. Uh, he's taking on. Li Jing Long is a late notice sub, and Kasuya is fighting Nick Hine, also on the Japan card. Um, they've also picked up Dong Yi Yang for his second UFC run to fight Jake Collier on their Seoul card. I'm I'm glad to see Yang get, uh, come back, even though he was like I think one and three in the UFC. I do feel like he got a little bit of a hard break. He seemed like a really fun. I don't know. Interesting fighter. Kind of, kind of will fall right into the general population of middleweight of big grinding guys who will lose, you know, lose two out of every five fights they're in. But 
what can you do? That's that's just the nature of the middleweight division. They also picked up recent um, tough uh, 21 ATT versus Black Zillions fighter Vincente Luque for another fight in the UFC. That, that surprises me a little since he lost his debut um, and doesn't have a very impressive record, 7-5-1. and five and one. He's not... Uh, he's a young fighter, so I can see there's some promise there. But they've got him fighting Hader Hassan on the Fox 17 card. They picked up the Barn Cat, Tamden McCrory. That was the other big signing news. Uh, stole him away from his Bellator contract, and he'll be facing Josh Saman also on that UFC on Fox 17 card. It's hard for me. That, that fight's a little hard for me. I want to root for McCrory. I want to root for the Barn Cat, but I can't not root for Saman. So... I uh, feel a little conflicted about that. And they picked up Dan Jolly, who we've already seen make his debut uh, short notice take on Misha Serkinov, which he lost, but scrambled all right, looked interesting as a light heavyweight. So we'll see what he can do for going forward from there. That, I believe, covers all the UFC signing and uh, cutting news for the last month. Just a quick recap, the UFC cut 17 fighters or cut reti- had retire or let go 17 fighters over the last month and signed uh, nine 10 10 fighters over that same period so they have definitely trimmed back their roster a bit especially after a month where they didn't cut very many people at all I guess this kind of makes up for a a low release July has led to or a low yeah low release July has led to a high release August and um, I'm not sure what we'll see next month but that's I don't know it, it the UFC's been a little back and forth on their their numbers from month to month it's not been as consistent as I'd expect but they always. Uh, seem to be fitting their talent, or th- their need to the moment, and you know, si- or keeping guys that they feel like they can use for specific cards, and cutting guys that they just don't feel like are right for them right now. So it's always hard to judge. There's always a few st- hangers on that I'm surprised about. Always a few guys that stick around when you don't expect them to, and always a few guys that go before you think they should. Till next time. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Give this a like. Um, subscribe to MMANation.com over on Facebook. That's D-O-T- MMA Nation, D-O-T-C-O-M, all spelled out, not on Facebook, on YouTube. I don't know where my head is right now, but thanks, everyone, for tuning in. You can find me over on Bloody Elbow and uh, on Twitter at Zane Simon. And I'll see you all next month or tomorrow for the MMA Vivisection if you just can't get enough of me.